Uh, hello, everybody. So um, a, a couple things I want to mention before I actually get started here. We've kind of um, put this out there as, um, you know, scary grammar issues. And I, I just want to tell you that the examples that, that I'm using, I don't think are particularly scary. Um, they are, I think, appropriately Halloween-y, most of them. Um, it'll help if you're familiar with uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but that's certainly not a requirement. I'm Tony, by the way. Let's get this started. All right. Uh, the title is obviously a joke. Um, there's no grammar police, thankfully. Um, but this is problems, common problems in student writing. So these are things that I, as a uh, an English professor, as well as a writing specialist, and all of us writing specialists in the uh, Academic Support Center, these are the, the problems that we see most often in student writing. And so when we say that it's really, you know, that it's a grammar review, it is, but it's a grammar kind of doing through uh, this mechanism of, of looking at um, common, common problems. Okay, so in order, what are the specific issues here? We've got subject verb agreement, fragments, run ons, and comma splices, verb tense, pronouns. And the pronouns, I'll just tell you right now, the pronouns is a fairly lengthy section and can get a little complicated. We might gloss over some of that um, if, uh, if we feel like, well, we've got a pretty good handle on this and so we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. And then I do have a small section on passive and active voice. So I do want to do a quick parts of speech review. Uh, this is all stuff that you should already know, um, but uh, I think it's useful to go through this because most of the issues that we're going to be discussing here depend on being able to identify the function of words within sentences. So parts of speech. Noun, we always start with, right, a person, place, thing, or, or idea, or concept. Um, every sentence to be a sentence has to have at least one of these truth is it'll usually have more than that but at least to have it needs to have at least one we call it the subject um and so the subject of the sentence is is going to be the primary noun and all of the, the words that go with it um noun related words pronouns which are basically nouns but they're um kind of little words that uh we use to replace nouns that have already been introduced um Thank goodness we have pronouns. If we didn't, we would spend a lot of time saying people's names. Um, pronouns make it much, much easier. Adjectives, of course, another noun-related uh, group of words that provide more information about a noun. We then have verbs, which uh, these indicate action or condition of existence, right, which for linguistic purposes is the same thing. In linguistic in a linguistic sense, to be is to act. It's it's a, it's an action, right? Existence is an action. Um, and like, as with nouns, every sentence in order to be grammatically considered a sentence must have a verb section as well. So you have to have the subject and all the words that go with it. And then you have to have what we call the predicate and all the words that go with that. So subject, predicate, together constitute a sentence. Um, Adverbs are verb-related uh, group of words. They modify and provide more information about a verb, or um, they can also modify adjectives. Prepositions. This is a large class of word. There are a lot of prepositions in English. Uh, they have multiple functions. Um, they seem primarily to have to do with time and space. Um, they're used to help uh, again, also in the creation of uh, phrases that function as other parts of speech. So this is a useful thing to know, which is that when we think of parts of speech, we think of individual words, right? An individual word is a noun or it's a verb or it's an adjective. Um, but you can have phrases that when you put them, you put words together to create a phrase, those phrases can also function as individual parts of speech. So you can have adjective phrases, you can have adverb phrases, um, you can have, those are prepositional phrases, but you can also have noun phrases, verb phrases, etc. cetera. Um, okay, conjunctions, everybody's favorite class of word, because I think um, most of us remember schoolhouse rock and conjunction junction, what's your function? Um, which is actually a great little cartoon, if any of you have ever seen it, because it uses train cars to talk about what um, conjunctions are for. And so you've got the linking cars, 
uh, all the, right, all the cars have words on them. And so the conjunction cars are shown connecting the different parts of the sentence or the different parts of the phrase, which is, of course, is what uh, conjunctions do. By the way, if you ever need to remember all of your coordinating conjunctions, just remember the word fan boys, F-A-N-B-O-Y-S. That's for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. That's all of your coordinating conjunctions. Now, we do have another group of conjunctions called subordinating conjunctions, um, which are common, but we don't. I don't think we need to really get into like what they are and what they do. We'll talk about them a little bit, but they're, you know, coordinating conjunctions are the primary thing that we're interested in when we talk about conjunctions. Um, now, interjections, um, this is, there are some people who don't consider this a part of speech. I do, uh, and I'll tell you why. It's because you have words like, oh, or hey, um, and that's literally the only thing they do is they are exclamations. Um, they don't have any other function, but they're common words. Uh, so to me, interjections, which which express emotions, you know, oh, or hey, or other things that we I'm sure we can think of, um, they don't really have any other purpose. And so to me, they do sort of stand apart as a separate part of speech. Uh, also articles. Okay, now this is the smallest group. Uh, there's only three of them. Um, the, an, and a, right? So they're little words and there's only three of them and they function in uh, uh, along with nouns. Um, and there's, we divide them into the definite article and indefinite articles and uh, they they do a fairly specific thing. So um, we'll, again, they're common, which is why I've included them here. There are some linguists who would say, well, articles aren't really a part of speech. They're more like a particle. I don't quite personally get the distinction, but whatever. That's a group of words that, that are unique and that have their own specific purpose. Okay, so a little bit of terminology. A phrase is a group of words that acts as a single part of speech consisting of noun phrases and predicate phrases, so nouns and verbs, uh, subjects and verbs, I should say, and prepositional phrases, which are either adjectives or adverbs, and which, if you're going to get specific about it, you would refer to as adjective phrases or adverb phrases. Prepositional phrase is a fine generic way to refer to those, though. Um, phrases do not contain a subject predicate pair, so they are phrases and not sentences or clauses. And a clause is uh, any group of words that contains a subject predicate pair, which means that any complete sentence is a clause. Specifically, it's an independent clause. Uh, now, there's another group that we call dependent or subordinate clauses. Those are uh, their clauses, they have a subject predicate pair, but they can't actually stand alone as a sentence. They have to be connected to an independent clause. We will see plenty of examples of that uh, as we go through this. The subject, the part of a sentence that contains the main noun and all of its modifiers. Now, I'm, there's a note here that says the subject must agree in number with its predicate. What that means is that if you have a plural subject, you have to have a plural predicate as well. Uh, and we'll we'll look at that. Uh, the predicate then is the part of a sentence that contains the main verb and all of its modifiers. And just like the subject, the main verb must also agree in number with its subject. Finally, the word antecedent, which you'll hear me use sometimes. Um, it's just a fancy word that refers to the specific noun that a pronoun is replacing. Uh, okay, so let's talk about subject verb agreement. We were just talking about how um, the subject and predicate have to agree in number. So a plural subject has to have a plural verb. Uh, and so here it, it actually says it, in order to be considered a sentence, a construction must have two things, a subject and a primary verb or predicate. The subject and predicate must agree in number. This means that if the subject is singular, the predicate or main verb must also be singular. In order to identify subject verb agreement error, you must be able to accurately identify the subject and a predicate of the sentence or clause. This can be challenging because for the most part, sentences are gonna have more than one noun and they're usually gonna have even more than one verb. So identifying which is the primary, the subject, and which is the primary verb, the predicate, that is what we have to be able to do in order to identify these 
uh, these kinds of errors. So what I have here is a list, uh, a series of um, examples that have errors. Uh, so I want us to look at them and identify the subject verb agreement errors. All right, so if we start with the first one, there's a bunch of squirrels that raid my bird feeder on a daily basis. So the first thing you want to do when you look at this in order to figure out where's the subject verb agreement error is, um, can you find the predicate, the main verb? Good way to start doing that is just to go through the sentence and identify all of the verbs. Okay, so yeah, is is the primary verb. Okay, now again, um, we you know we in our our definition of a verb, these small verbs that are about existence, right? Is be was etc. Um, those are verbs, uh, and they are frequently the primary verb in a sentence. When you have a sentence like this that says there is or there was or I am, right? Um, those are small verbs of being. Sometimes we, uh, uh, some people just call them to be verbs. Um, but re regardless, they are verbs that talk about existence, right? Um, and so they are frequently the main verb. The other verb, by the way, is raid. Okay, now when you look at that, you see raid there. Anybody have any sense as to why that's not the primary verb? Generally speaking, when you're when you're working on stuff like this, work backwards from the word that you're that you're looking at. Since raid is the word that we're that we're, we're thinking about, if you work backwards, the word right before it is that, which is a relative pronoun. Relative pronouns are very, very, very frequently used to begin subordinate clauses. And that is exactly what this is. That raid my bird feeder on a daily basis um, is a subordinate clause. If you took it out, it would not be able to stand as a complete sentence. Uh, and so it has to be connected to this uh, independent clause. So if is is the primary verb, Pardon me, can you identify the primary um, noun? What is the thing that is ising here? Bunch of squirrels. Okay, now let me point out something here. I, when I've gone through this before in the past, a lot of students uh, automatically jump on squirrels as the subject. Now, again, if you look at squirrels and you work backwards, the word right before it is of which is a preposition. Now that means that squirrels is the object of the preposition. So it can't be the subject by itself. This phrase, this prepositional phrase of squirrels, which is a, an adjective phrase here, um, modifying bunch. Bunch of squirrels altogether is the subject. If you wanted to narrow it down to a single word, it would have to be bunch. This is important, and I'll tell you why. Because if you would just go to, to go with squirrels, then is would have to be are, right? So if it was just there are squirrels that raid my bird feeder, then that verb and that noun agree in terms of number. Are is a plural verb. Squirrels is a plural noun. There are squirrels that raid my bird feeder. Problem here is that it's not squirrels isn't the subject by itself it's bunch of squirrels and bunch is a singular noun right if you think about it you can take the word bunch and you can make it plural by referring to bunches right so it's a singular noun since that you know again if uh, that's the primary the word itself is the primary subject, um it's singular which means that that verb needs to be singular as well. So there is a bunch. So that's correct. If you keep moving, though, and we go into this subordinate clause, what happens to, to this other verb? Whoever wrote this sentence is uh, wrote the word raid as if it was um, referring back to the squirrels. But again, it can't be because squirrels is the object of the preposition. It's got to you got to go back further to the subject. So there is a bunch of squirrels that raids, bunch raids, singular, singular. Okay, let's look at this next number three. We'll skip number two. Either the ghost or the poltergeist are going to have to leave this house. Now that's uh, clearly suggesting that, um, that that house is haunted. 
So either the ghost or the poltergeist are going to have to leave this house. So where's the verb again? Okay, so again, it's it's a little verb of being, are. Now, typically in, in English uh, syntax, uh, there is a there is a, um, a, a sort of typical format to the way we put sentences together. What does that mean? That means that we usually start with the subject that's followed by the verb, and the verb is followed by whatever object it is that you have. Um, so subject usually precedes verb, usually, most of the time. Not always, most of the time. Um, and so if we're going to assume that in most cases the verb or the, the primary noun comes first in the sentence, once you find the main verb, if you work backwards again, you will eventually run into the subject. So if we work backwards, the first noun we run into is poltergeist. Okay, potential subject. Keep going. The is an article or is a, sub a conjunction. Neither of those can be the subject. Ghost, that's a noun. Potential subject. Again, the is an article and either is a conjunction because it works in tandem with or. So the only potential subjects here can be are that they have to, it has to be either poltergeist or ghost or both. And I'm going to tell you this one's a little bit tricky because of the either or. Conjunctions can change the way we think about our nouns. Um, so if this said both the ghost and the poltergeist are going to have to leave this house, that would be grammatically correct because even though ghost and poltergeist are singular individually, when you stick and between them, it becomes two things, right? A ghost and a poltergeist. So together they constitute a plural double or compound subject, which means that the, the primary verb, are, needs to be plural as well. So both the ghost and the poltergeist are going to have to leave this house. What makes this one tricky is that either or doesn't work the same way. Either or is requiring you to choose one. So it does not automatically take these two nouns, ghost and poltergeist, and make them two things. They're still singular individuals. So it's either the ghost or the poltergeist, two singular things that have not been joined together here, which means that the verb needs to be singular as well. So this should actually be either the ghost or the poltergeist is going to have to leave this house, right? And a, an easy way to kind of figure that out because it's either or is to take out one of them. The ghost is going to have to leave this house or the poltergeist is going to have to leave this house. Let's look at one more. The moaning and the cackling keeps me up half the night. Now, this is what I was just talking about. Moaning is a singular noun. Cackling is a singular noun. You put them together with and, and it becomes two things, moaning and cackling, which means that this verb needs to be fixed. Um, the moaning and cackling keep me up half the night because, again, you put the two of them together with a conjunction and it becomes two things, becomes plural. So the moaning and the cackling keep me up half the night. Yeah, let's talk about fragments, run-ons, and comma splices. So a fragment is an incomplete sentence or a dependent clause that has been punctuated as though it is a complete sentence. Each of these issues, fragments, run-ons, and comma splices, these are punctuation problems, okay? Uh, and we'll look at some examples so you'll see what I mean. A run-on is two or more complete sentences or independent clauses that have been improperly punctuated and joined together as if they are one sentence. In other words, they're, they're two or more complete sentences that have been stuck together without any punctuation. Okay, some punctuation is necessary. We have to talk about what kind of punctuation, but a run-on is two complete sentences punctuated as if they're one sentence with no, with nothing to separate them. Okay, a comma splice is the same thing. Two or more complete sentences that have been improperly joined together using a comma or commas, right? So it's, it's the same thing as a run-on, but where a run-on doesn't have any punctuation, a comma splice 
has a comma, which is the wrong punctuation. So we need to figure out what the correct punctuation is there. Okay, so let's look at what this means. So this here we're just looking at fragments. So let's take it one piece at a time. Writing is among the greatest inventions in human history. Just look at that right there. Is there anything wrong with that sentence? Is, is there anything about that, that that says, I'm not a complete sentence, I'm a fragment? If you're thinking, no, there's nothing wrong with that sentence, you are absolutely correct. There, That's a perfectly fine sentence. Subject, verb, uh, it stands alone by itself, no problem. It ends with a period. That is a uh, correctly punctuated, complete sentence. Look at the next one. Perhaps the greatest. Now, if you're thinking that doesn't really sound like a sentence, you're right. Um, and if you try to break it down, what you're going to find is that not only does that construction not have a subject, it doesn't have a verb either. Um, it's the best thing you can say about it is that it's a phrase. Now, the nature of fragments is that they tend to be written during the composition process almost as afterthoughts. And so more often than not, you can correct them by attaching them to the sentence that comes right before them. Uh, and that is, you can certainly do that in this case. Writing is among the greatest inventions in human history, perhaps the greatest. You can change that period after history, greatest inventions in human history, change that to a comma, and then perhaps the greatest works perfectly well. Okay, so you fix that fragment just by changing the period after history to uh, a comma. Now, if you keep going and you look at because it made history possible, again, something about that doesn't sound right. Um, and if that's what you were thinking, you're right. It's a fragment. In this case, it's actually an uh, a dependent clause. It has a subject, it, verb, made. But it begins with um, subordinate conjunction because it made history possible. That is a clear sort of red flag indicator that this is probably a subordinate clause because they often, you often start subordinate clauses with either a subordinating conjunction or a relative pronoun. That's what's happening here with subordinate uh, clause, um, conjunction, sorry. So again, this probably belongs with what came before it. So again, if you change this period after greatest to a comma, what you get is writing is among the greatest inventions in human history, perhaps the greatest because it made history possible. And that's all one sentence. Uh, and it's perfectly grammatically, it's fine. Okay. Now, if you keep going, you have yet it is a skill most of us take for granted. Um, now, if you're like most readers, you hear that sentence and you don't hear anything wrong with it. I don't hear anything wrong with it. There isn't really anything wrong with it. However, there are linguists and grammarians and writing teachers out there who will flag that sentence and say, well, technically, grammatically, it's a fragment because it begins with a coordinating conjunction and coordinating conjunctions job is to connect to something else. And if you start the sentence with a coordinating conjunction, you're, you're not grammatically connected to anything, if that makes sense, okay? Um, so in a technical sense, from a grammatical standpoint, yes, that is technically a fragment because that coordinating conjunction at the beginning doesn't have anything to connect to grammatically. Here's the thing though, we all do it. Everybody does it. Everybody starts sentences with coordinating conjunctions. And, but, yet, so, right? And most people don't have a problem with it. Um, it is technically a fragment, but it's one of those situations where common usage has sort of um, made it so that it's not really considered an error anymore. Um, Believe it or not, it's it's not inappropriate if you're in a class situation to ask your professor, do you have a problem with sentences that start with coordinating conjunctions? Okay, so there are more examples here, but I'm I'm trying to be mindful of our time. So I'm we're gonna jump ahead and look at uh run-ons and comma splices. 
Okay, so first sentence here. The first issue of Action Comics was published in April of 1938. It featured Superman on the cover and in the lead story. Okay, so um, you may have guessed that this is a classic run-on. It is two complete sentences that have been stuck together without any kind of punctuation to differentiate between the two parts of the sentence. Now, there are, in fact, um, a couple of ways to, to fix this problem. One of them is to just make it two sentences. Stick a period after 1938, capitalize it, and you have two sentences. The first issue, etc., it featured, etc., a period is a definite um, stop. The British call it a full stop, right? If you want to suggest uh, not as dramatic a separation, you could use a semicolon as well. Semicolon would be perfectly fine just by itself. Um, and in some ways, it's the easiest thing to do because you just stick a semicolon in there and you don't have to do anything else. Um, the third thing to do is to use a comma but you can't use a comma by itself, because if you just stick a comma in there, you've turned the run-on into a comma splice. So you need a comma with a conjunction. In this case, I would go with and, right? So the first fish fiction comics published in April of 1938, comma, and it featured Superman on the cover and so on. Okay, so that's classic run-on. Um, if we look at the next one, the initial print run was only 200,000 copies. But by the seventh issue, the title was selling over half a million copies every month. One publisher remembered that the response of readers was immediate and enthusiastic. So this is another comma or another run on, right? The comma after copies here is perfectly fine, comma followed by a coordinating conjunction, but it's right here. Over half a million copies every month, one publisher remembered. So that's the break right there. And so again, you need something there, either a semicolon or a, a period. Okay. So let's talk about verb tense. Verbs indicate not only action, but also the time frame, right? So a verb tells us what is being done, what happens, what action is happening, um, but it also tells us when it's happening. And that's, that's what tense is. Um, they fall into one of three categories, past, present, or future. Uh, here, I'm only going to look at past and present. Future, future is pretty common, and I think most of us have a fairly instinctive understanding of how to use it. But it can also get fairly complicated, and we don't have the time to get future tenses. So um, I'm just going to focus on past and present. Um, so you in, in the verb. In the way a verb is put together in a sentence, it can tell us not just when, uh, like a specific time frame for an action, but it can give us degrees of time. It can it can suggest timelines that one action, for example, took place before another one. Um, for simplicity's sake, I usually just refer to these as perfect tenses. Technically, they're not really tenses; they're they're called aspects. But you don't need to worry about that. It's, an, it's just a more detailed way of talking about tense, okay? So a perfect tense uh, or a perfect aspect, they're recognized by identifying the tense of the helping verb, okay? So perfect verbs have helping verbs. There's a verb and a helping verb. Helping verbs like has or had, have, things like that. Um, and you identify whether it's past perfect or present perfect, by identifying the tense of the helping verb. So a verb that has a past tense helping verb with it is said to be past perfect. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Whenever Professor Snape had called on me, I stutter nervously. In this case, it's that the tenses are all over the place. You have whenever Professor Snape had called on me. So you have a past perfect verb there, had called. And then in the main clause, I stutter nervously, that's a present tense verb. So you've got two verb tenses that are not talking to each other here. In order to correct it, 
one of the things you have to do is kind of identify how many things are going on here. In this case, you've got two things. There's calling on and there's stuttering. If you want to make a distinction between whether one thing happened before the other, then you, you, would, you would want to use a perfect tense. You don't need to here, though. Uh, this is a simple enough sentence, and it's suggesting that the two things are happening pretty much right at the same time. The professor calls on me, I stutter, right? They're so close together that it's not worth distinguishing between them that one happened before the other. So in this case, I would simplify it, and there's two ways you can do that. If you're speaking of something that used to happen, right? Maybe you've graduated and you're talking about a class that you had when you were a student. If that's the case, then you just use the past tense. Whenever Professor Snape called on me, I stuttered nervously. So the whole thing is past tense. It's all something that happened in the past, and you don't have to distinguish between what thing happened first. It all happened a long time ago. Okay. The other thing is to say, is to use present tense and say it's all happy, you know, it's, this is a now thing. I, I am currently a student in Professor Snape's class. So you, you would use present tense. Whenever Professor Snape calls on me, I stutter nervously. Okay. So what's happened here is somebody has made this way more complicated than it needs to be and is trying to just, you know, suggest that, well, the calling on me happened before the stuttering and, and they've gotten their tenses all confused. Keep it simple, either past tense or present tense. You don't need anything more complicated than that. Look at the next one. When, when Miss Alphaba has finished speaking, everyone applauded. Two different tenses here uh, in, the, in the dependent clause. When Miss Alphaba has finished speaking, you have a present perfect verb. In the main clause, everyone applauded, you have a simple past tense verb. So again, here, um, you have to decide, is there a time sequence, right? A sequence of events here that is distinctive enough that I need to make a distinction between them? Or are they basically happening one right after the other? Uh, or, you know, essentially at the same time. Again, here, I think you don't need to make the distinction. It starts by saying when, so that suggests that these are happening more or less at the same time. So in this case, I would, again, I would remove the perfect. So instead of when Miss Alphaba has finished speaking, I would simply say when Miss Alphaba finished speaking, everyone applauded. Simple past tense. Everybody understands what's being said, and there's no reason to make it any more complicated. Okay, let's look at another. I loved cats since I was a little girl. This is a situation where you actually need a perfect verb. And I'll tell you, you what you need is a present perfect verb. I have loved cats since I was a little girl. That present tense helping verb, have, along with loved, I have loved, that's a very specific kind of verb and it does something very particular. It tells you that something started in the past and it's still going on now. So in this case, when you say, I have loved cats since I was a little girl, it clearly means that I started loving cats when I was a little girl and I still love them now. That's the most common way we would use a present perfect verb. I have loved cats since I was a little girl. Here's another one that uses perfect verbs. And I think, or it needs, it should use perfect verbs. And it's because you've got two different things happening and here it's important to differentiate between which one happened first okay he just crossed the street when the runaway car had crashed into the bank building so you have two actions here crossing and crashing which one happens first okay so if you're thinking the crossing happened before the crashing you're right what the past perfect verb tense here does is it's it, it it allows you to take that past perfect verb, had, and put it with the action that happened first. So here it's with crashed, wrong place. The crash came second. The crossing happened first. This is a situation where they're telling you that this person narrowly missed getting hit by this car, right? It should be he had just crossed the street when the runaway car crashed into the bank building, right? It clearly suggests the crossing happened first. He had crossed when the runaway car crashed. 
the crossing happened first. And as soon as he had done that, the car crashed into the bank building. Pronouns. Special words that have unique properties and problems, including pronoun agreement issues, vague pronoun references, and issues with respect to correct pronoun function. I'm going to talk about all of this. I'm going to try to do it fairly quickly without making it confusing. Pronoun agreement. This is, has become a relatively complicated issue. Simply stated, pronouns must agree in number, person, and gender with the nouns that they refer to. Okay, so, so the first thing that I need to point out here is that pronouns have these four qualities. All pronouns have number, so they're either singular or plural. They have what we call person, so they're either first person, second person, or third person. They have gender, so they're either feminine, masculine, or neutral. And they have what we call function or case, which means that they either function as subjects or objects. They can do all four of those things. And when they're doing all four of those things, they're doing all four of those things together. So when we talk about agreement, we're talking about the fact that it has to agree in all of those particular areas, particularly number. Now, if a noun is naming a person of known gender, right? So if you know that the noun you are referring to with the pronoun identifies as masculine or feminine, then you use the appropriate gendered pronouns, right? So if you have um, a masculine pronoun referring to a person identified as female, then the noun and the pronoun don't agree and you have to fix it. So here's where it gets complicated. If a noun is referring to a person of unknown or a non-binary gender, the plural pronouns they, them, themselves, their, or theirs may be used. Frankly, they should be used. This is a relatively recent development in terms of the history of the English language. Um, as recently as five years ago, a lot of us were still teaching that you can't use they, them, as singular because they are plural pronouns. That is no longer the case. This is large, this is accepted by all the writing books and all of the documentation manuals. And, and this is this is an accepted usage now. Okay. So they, them, these are these traditionally plural pronouns now also have a secondary singular usage for when you need to refer to singular persons of unknown or non-binary gender. I feel like I have to point this out because you may actually still occasionally run into a professor somewhere who says, you can't do that. They is a plural pronoun. Whatever noun it refers to has to be plural as well. They are outliers. Okay. You need to know that because the vast majority of language teachers and writing teachers and grammar uh gurus and, and linguists have accepted the, the singular usage of they, them, etc. Okay, let's talk about vague pronouns. A pronoun could be called vague if it refers to an unspecified number of possible uh, nouns. So here's an example. Spike's hobbies include fishing, skiing, and zombie hunting. It requires a lot of money for good equipment. So your pronoun here is it. The problem with it is that you can't tell if it's referring to fishing, skiing, or zombie hunting. It could be referring to any one of them, or all of them, or some combination of them. We don't know. The pronoun by itself is not telling us. So you have to correct that vague pronoun by adding specifics. One way to do that is like this. Spike's hobbies include fishing, skiing, and zombie hunting. These pursuits require a lot of money for good equipment which indicates that the pronoun it was referring to all three of those things. You've replaced the pronoun, though, with these pursuits. It's what you have to do in order to get rid of the vague pronoun. Or if you're only referring to one of them, then you would say so. Spike's hobbies include fishing, skiing, and zombie hunting. Zombie hunting requires a lot of money for good equipment. In this case, you're specifying which of the three things you're referring to. Another way, uh, a kind of vague pronoun can be where a pronoun appears to refer to nothing. You can't identify what it's referring to. So it could look like this. Contrary to their promise not to hurt anyone, the zombies tried to eat the brains, 
of all the people in the room. That surely surprised and angered them. The pronoun here is that. And it's they because we don't know what it's referring to. What surely surprised and angered them? And who's the them? You've got two vague pronouns there. Um, to clarify it, contrary to their promise not to hurt anyone, the zombies tried to eat the brains of all the people in the room. That attack surely surprised and angered the people. So both of those, the attack, you're specifying what that referred to, and the people, you're specifying um, who were surprised and angered. Okay, so it's clarifying what that and them are referring to. Okay, let's talk a little bit about pronoun function, objects and subjects, right? So all pronouns uh, are going to be acting either as object or subjects, and their form of the word changes to indicate whether they're the subject or the object. Now, it's important to remember in terms of, of the way the sentence is constructed, the subject performs the action, the object receives it in singular form. I, you, he, she, or it. So that's first person, second person, and third person. I, you, he, she, it performs the action for me, you, him, her, it, right? So again, first person, second person, third person. So what you have here is the subject form, I, you, he, she, it, performing the action for the object forms, me, you, him, her, it, all singular. In plural, it would be we, you, they, perform the action for us, you, them. Now, I've put it together as a chart, so it's a little easier to see. Singular, first person, second person, and third person. And the subject form, I, you, he, she, it. Object form, me, you, him, her, it. And then in the plural, subject form, first, second, and third person, we, you, they, they, they. And object form, us, you, them, them, them. Now, you notice that second person never changes. <laughs> second person is always you. Um, and you'll also notice that uh, in the plural form, the third person never changes. They, 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 and them, them, them. So, and you only changes its form when it becomes possessive and it becomes your. Uh, the third person plural forms change only for function and not for gender. Okay, so let's look at how this works. So, Buffy and me went out to fight the zombies. Okay. Now, if you hear that and you think, yeah, that sounds fine, take out Buffy and try to say it the way it is using that form of the pronoun. If you take out Buffy, it becomes me went out to fight the zombies. You would never say that. That is quite obviously wrong. That's because me is the object form. And what you need here is the subject form. You need the thing that's doing the thing. And so it should be I. I went out to fight the zombies. So put Buffy back in and it becomes Buffy and I both went out to fight the zombies. So that's a first person singular subject form of the pronoun. They destroyed the zombies just for she. Again, that should scream at you. No, nobody would ever say that. It's because the writer of this sentence is using the subject form, but needs the object. They destroyed the zombies just for her. She is the subject form. Her is the object form. Here it is again. She gave I a crossbow bow to kill zombies, right? The subject performs the action for the object. Subject she performs the action gave for the object, which is I. That's the subject form. You need the object form, which is me. Okay, relative pronouns. And we all know what these are because we use them all the time. And we all have a tendency to make these much more complicated and difficult than they actually are. Okay, what are relative pronouns? Who, whom, that, and which. Most easily confused pronouns are the relative pronouns. They have to do with relationships. They need only be considered in terms of their antecedents or the nouns that they are referring to. So that and which refer only to things and objects. Who and whom refer only to people. And that is the difference. It's that simple, okay? So it looks like this. The crossbow that you ordered to kill zombies arrived today. That referring to a crossbow, which is a thing. The crossbow, which I need to kill zombies, arrived today. Slightly different, and I can we can get into this in a, in a minute, um, using which instead of that. But they both are used for things. 
in this case, the crossbow. So you use that or which. The woman who read my zombie apocalypse novel is a professional editor. I've known her since graduate school. Woman is a person. So you need the form of the relative pronoun that refers to people. So in this case, it's who. Uh, another form of it would be I asked a professional editor whom I have known since graduate school to read my zombie apocalypse novel. Same basic idea. Editor is a person whom, right? So you use the person form of the, the pronoun. In this case, it's whom. So who and whom are further distinguished by their function. Who is the subject form? Whom is the object form? Um, one way to kind of distinguish, uh, this will work for you most of the time. In general, uh, the word serving as the subject is positioned just before the verb. So if the word immediately after the who or whom or after the pronoun is a verb, you should use the subject form, which is who. If the word immediately after the pronoun is a noun, you should choose the object form whom. Again, this works probably 99% of the time. So here's what it looks like. The woman who read my novel is a professional editor. I asked a professional editor whom I have known since graduate school to read my novel. Who, the pronoun here followed by read, which is a verb. So you use the subject form. I asked a professional editor whom I have known. I is a noun, pronoun. So you use the object form. That and which have slightly different uses which is typically used for uh, what we call non-essential information. It is usually set off by a comma or a sentence, uh, which is what I did in the sentence that you just read. But if you look at the example, his most recent zombie book, comma, which I bought and read as soon as it was published, was very enjoyable. Which I bought and read as soon as it was published is interesting, arguably, uh, but it's definitely not essential. You don't need to know that. The sentence will still make sense if we take it out. His most recent zombie book was very enjoyable, right? So it's non-essential information. So we use which and we set it off with commas. Look at the sentence, second clause, but his first book is the one that I most often recommend to my students. That's essential information, right? If you take out that I most often recommend to my students, students, you don't have a sentence. It's not finished. And so there's no commas there. Uh, all right, very quickly, I want to go over active versus passive verbs. This should just take a minute. Um, so all action verbs are said to occur in one of two voices, the active or the passive. Most sentences are by default active constructions in which the subject or the actor performs the main action of the sentence and the object receives the main action from the subject. So the subject comes before the verb, which comes before the object. So it's the typical format is subject, verb, object. An example of this is Antinobia tracked the zombie to a cemetery outside of town. The subject, Antinobia, performs the action of tracking to the object or for the object, the zombie. Passive constructions reverse this relationship by having the subject and the object switch places so that the object now comes before the verb and the subject comes after it, or by taking out the subject altogether. And this is what it looks like. The zombie was tracked by Aunt Zenobia to a cemetery outside of town. So the object here, the zombie, is receiving the action of tracking from the subject, Aunt Zenobia, but it's reversed because the verb has become passive here was tracked. And that's a good way to identify a passive verb is that it's usually a compound uh, like this that involves uh, a, 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 you know, a smaller, um, you know, helping verb was in this case was tracked. Or you take out the subject altogether. The subject was tracked to a cemetery outside of town. The object in this case, the zombie receives the action of tracking but we don't know from where, there's no subject. The, sob the zombie was tracked to a cemetery outside of town. It's an implied subject. Um, and now here's the thing, passive verbs can be very, um, they're not ungrammatical uh, and they have their uses and sometimes they're preferred in scientific writing when you wish to emphasize the actions of the scientists rather than the scientists, you use passive constructions. For those of you who might be in, say, nursing or criminal justice, there are many, many situations in which you might be writing a report and you don't know who is responsible for something. If you're writing a report about a crime scene, 
a robbery, say somebody broke into a house or somebody broke into a car, but you don't know who that was, right? You don't have a suspect. You don't have anybody in custody. You just have a, a car that's been broken into. Then that's what you would say is the car was broken into. You don't know who, by who, so you can't say by who. So the logical, natural thing to do is use a passive construction. The same thing in nursing situations where you don't have a person necessarily uh, or an agent that's responsible for something. It's just a thing that happened, right? Um, so you would use passive constructions for those. Um, most editors and composition teachers will tell you to keep your verbs active. Don't overuse passive constructions. Um, but again, it really does depend on the situation and what you are wanting to emphasize. If you want to emphasize the action rather than whatever is performing the action, you use passive voice to do it. Um, so they're usually structured this way, a subject followed by some version of a to be verb, followed by a past participle or a verb that typically ends in ed, but may sometimes take a more irregular form. So the verb was tracked in those examples is passive. To make a passive verb construction into an active one, take the two nouns on either side of the verb and flip them around and then remove the helping verb so that instead of was tracked, it becomes just tracked, right? The zombie was tracked by Aunt Zenobia, flip it, take out the, the helping verb, and it becomes Aunt Zenobia tracked the zombie, okay? To identify passive constructions, you've gotta be able to tell which noun is the subject. In other words, you have to be able to identify the noun that is the primary actor of the action of the sentence. And my friends, that is the whole thing.